Welcome to the City Club of Eugene's June 11th, 2021 program, Why Playgrounds Are Worth the Price. This is a 36th program for our 2020-21 programming year. My name is Kitty Piercy and I'm the City Club President. Support for the City Club is provided by our members and sponsors. You can become a member of the City Club at our website, cityclubofeugene.org. Our programs are always available on YouTube channel and on our Facebook page and are broadcast on public radio station KLCC 89.7 on Mondays at 7. We have both business and in-kind sponsors, including our diamond sponsors, Kaiser Permanente, University of Oregon, Peace Health, and Lane Community College as well as generous support for the city of Eugene and from Lane County. In today's program, we welcome Emily Proudfoot, Principal Landscape Architect of the city of Eugene. I got to know Emily when I was mayor of Eugene, so I'm really looking forward to this presentation. Biographical information on our speakers is available on our website, cityclubofeugene.org. I would like to thank Mary Layton for coordinating today's program. In 2018, Eugene voters approved a bond measure that would produce more than 39 million for parks, recreation centers, and playgrounds. By the end of this year, about a dozen projects will be complete. Earlier, the city spent more than 1.1 million on renovations at Amazon Playground. Many remember playgrounds of yore were kids glad to find a metal slide, a set of big swings and a merry-go-round with a puddle filling the rut around it. What have we learned that makes us willing to invest so much now in child's play? The city of Eugene's Emily Proudfoot will explain and discuss. Our format today includes a question and answer period with city club members via Zoom. Thanks, Kitty. And this is Mary Layton. I'm a member of the program committee, but more relevant to this program, I'm a grandma. And like most of the grandmas in town who have grandchildren available, I've gotten more familiar with parks this year than I might otherwise have been. The other day when I was at Amazon Park, I was noticing how the kids were interacting with the equipment. And on one really nice day, I noticed that many of the grownups were lying on the turf uh, and the children were carefully stepping over them uh, because it was such nice turf. And I began to wonder, how did this park come to be this way? It's, it works so well for the children it serves. Who thinks up this stuff? So I had, uh, for some reason, I had the uh, address of the person, of a person in the city who might know, and I sent that person uh, the question, who's in charge of parks? Who makes the playgrounds so nice? And, uh, and that person said, Emily Proudfoot. So I asked Emily Proudfoot if she would talk to us about how she makes decisions about playgrounds. What are the variables that are involved? How does she, you know, why do they cost so much? Uh, which is part of why they look the way they look. So I asked Emily to start in honor of graduation week to talk a little bit about her career path perhaps to inspire some of this year's graduates to think about being a playground designer. And then Emily will explain to us how parks and playgrounds are designed and, and why they cost so much. Emily. Well, thank you, Mary, and uh, good afternoon, City Club, and thanks for having me today. Um, so to answer Mary's first question, um, how did I become a playground designer? Well. I uh, have a bachelor's degree in landscape architecture from the University of Oregon. Um, and with that degree, you can do many things. And so over the years, I've worked in uh, private practice. And then uh, starting in 1999, I began my work uh, with the city of Eugene as a landscape architect and project manager for uh, parks and open space. Um, at the time, I was in charge of implementing park projects for 
uh, the 1998 bond measure that had passed at the time. And then for the last 22 years, I've been involved in designing and implementing and planning for parks and playgrounds across the community. Um, most of my work has been in uh, developed parks. And so you'll hear uh, more between the distinction between developed uh, parks and natural areas. But um, my work overall has been uh, really kind of developed through experience and um, really what was, what's was what been fun for my own children and, and then being inspired by, you know, playgrounds across the world that, you know, we look at with our colleagues in municipal governments or uh, local design offices throughout the country. So um, that has what is brought me here today. Um, and so uh, it is a topic, playgrounds are a topic that are near and dear to my heart. And so I'm happy to be, I'm really happy to be able to share the city's work in this realm. I'll be presenting some basics about how we plan for, plan for playgrounds across the city and then why they're an important component of our developed park system. So I'll start sharing my screen here with slides. All right. So um, I'll just I'll start by talking about pl planning for playgrounds uh, citywide. Um, I'll share some and so the questions about why do we even build playgrounds, which is um, I'll share some uh, information about child development and then um, uh, just basics about playground design and how we've innovated over time. Um, project costs or what I prefer to think of uh, as investments and then where we're headed in the future of playground design within Eugene's parks and open space system. So to begin with, um, uh, we have over 5,000 total acres in parks ownership in our city of Eugene Park system. More than 4,000 acres uh, of that of our system is within natural areas, which um, I always like to think of as a solid balance for a community that values conservation so highly. Um, in addition, we have 600 acres of developed parks. So those are parks that include benches and playgrounds and sort of typical park amenities. Um, and then we have 325 acres of future developed parks. So parks land that we own, but that have not been yet developed as uh, developed parks. So how do we choose where to put playgrounds? Well, playgrounds are actually um, a pretty big indicator of service levels in general um, across the city. So um, in these two maps, you can see uh, on the left, park and playground service areas. Um, we, we did some gap analysis as part of our system planning uh, in 2015 and 16. Um, for those of you on the radio, on this map, there are orange areas that and red areas that are areas shown on this map as relatively unserved by park playgrounds. And so um, we do include school playgrounds as part of that service. Um, and so uh, the school district does give us a big boost in playground service by uh, keeping their playgrounds open to the general public when school is not in session. Um, and then on the right, we have um, existing and proposed playgrounds. And so again, for those of you on the radio, there's orange stars all over the map, um, probably about 20 of them where we're proposing um, new playgrounds across the community. Now, this is basically geographic equity. Um, and so are we distributing them evenly across the community? Um, so uh, we all know that kids love playgrounds and they're popular in Eugene, but what are other good reasons for playground construction? Well, from a child development standpoint, and, and this is a very sort of basic starter, but um, public playgrounds serve an important role in providing a place where children develop critical human functions. So, um, so tactile learning is obviously learning through touch. Um, we, uh, one of the things that we put in, these are all photos of the Amazon Park playground. And actually one of the things that many people have exclaimed to us is that a lot of people love the touch and feel of the turf there. Um, but learning to grip things or climb things or play music, that tactile learning is very important for children. Um, vestibular um, 
is a your vestibular system is one that uh, where you learn that develops and to uh, figure out balance and your general uh, equilibrium and then coordinating your your head and your eyes and so um, you know spinning and swinging and those kinds of bodily movements are very important to developing the vestibular system um, and kids do that all the time but they'll just hang from a little bar and swing um, because it's something that their body is uh, you know telling to do as part of that developmental process and then proprioception is the development of muscles and movement and awareness of your body position so of course um, again, you know, spinning, swimming, uh, swinging, climbing, sliding, those kinds of things, uh, and climbing in particular, uh, really help build that proprioceptive um, uh, system in your body. And then certainly last, but definitely not le least, um, social interaction, um, you know, within a playground setting is really critical for all people regardless of your age or ability and so you know playing imaginative games cooperating making space for each other um you know chasing just playing in general are very important to um developing social interactions and then secondly um you know there is there are volumes of critical research and writing on the importance of ch children experiencing the outdoors and i you know as we come out of the covid pandemic um i think that we probably couldn't be more aware of how important the outdoors um has been for all of us in uh maintaining our mental health through a really really difficult time and of course children um are definitely included in that mix so um but again much of this research um shows that you know being outside is really important for stress reduction um it's important uh for discovery so you know what can you find out out there that you couldn't find out by just being inside um so discovery about your bodies discover about nature all kinds of things um it develops communication and problem solving so cooperation with other people challenges and success so really um being able to accomplish something in the outdoors um the outdoors provides all kinds of opportunities for that um it promotes healthy bodies uh creates childhood memories and even builds communities so a lot of times we come together around playgrounds we go for a hike all together you meet a parent you haven't met before or a grandparent or you know you talk about how your children are developing together whatever it is um, parks and playgrounds play a huge role in building community and as social beings, um, and as we found out again in COVID, um, that social interaction is really critical to uh, keep staying positive within our mental health realm. So um, let's talk a little bit about design. So as a professional, I have a list of criteria that I think about when I'm designing or reviewing the design of a playground. Um, and since I've done a lot of playgrounds, I, uh, I, you know, even though I sort of at a little bit more of a management level this these days, I'm still pretty involved in even things uh, like, you know, making sure that there's enough diversity of components, um, that the layout looks good, and I even pick colors. Uh, so, um, from my perspective, these are the goals we should try to accomplish when we're designing a playground. So a playground should engage kids to use all different parts of their body. So if you only have steps and slides, well, you don't, you know, you're not doing any overhead activities or climbing or some things like that. So I like to see a diversity of activities. Um, it should include items that foster pretend play. So is there a tiny little shop counter? Or are there some little benches in a little circle? Or are there, you know, is there a sand play table where you add water and make cakes? Um, ideally, the equipment shouldn't tell you how to play with it. So I think, you know, um, it, it may not be intuitive how to interact with a piece and that's all the, all the better often for children, just in kind of figuring out um, some kinesthetic things about their body. So a slide is fairly obvious. You climb the stairs and you slide down. And that, you know, that's a classic piece. Um, 
but maybe there's an awkward ladder that you don't know how to climb, or there's some ropes and some funny bubbles, and how do you interact with that? And so I think that just engages a different part of your brain as a child, and that's really valuable. Um, it, it, it creates the opportunity for creative problem solving. Um, include the classics if you have room. So uh, classics, of course, swings, slides, and merry-go-rounds are always very popular. Um, and in playground design, we definitely have to keep space between pieces of equipment. So if you have room for swings, it's great to put them in. Everybody loves a swing. And then uh, my last bullet here is design for inclusion as much as possible. So uh, inclusion really means that we're um, creating a space where as many people of different ages and abilities can play within the same realm. Um, a lot of that has to do with firm surfacing, and I'll talk about that in a, a few minutes. But again, um, really providing a space where everyone can be included is a very valuable component of a playground. So uh, how do you know, how do we know if we're gonna build a big playground or a small playground? Um, so basically, we're building playgrounds in two different types of parks, uh, our community and metropolitan park playgrounds. Um, so maybe think of uh, Skinner Butte or Amazon Park, Westmoreland Park or Bethel Park. Those are community and metropolitan parks. Um, you know, and in those spaces, we can build a much bigger playground because we are serving a much broader area. So generally, we have a two mile service area. And um, and then a lot of times these playgrounds are also destinations. So uh, we definitely include more amenities for different age groups. We usually have spray play. Maybe there's a skate park nearby, sand and water, a restroom, and definitely as we're developing new playgrounds, fully inclusive surfacing. So that turf surfacing that you see that we have at Amazon is definitely our way forward um, in community parks. Neighborhood park playgrounds are definitely smaller. Um, they're within neighborhood scale parks. Uh, they're within a half mile walking service area. So, and that's a safe walking. So you don't cross a major arterial, like let's say West 18th Avenue, unless there's a specific pedestrian crossing that you can cross. Um, they usually have fewer elements while maintaining a variety of activities. And then usually they don't have spray play. Sometimes there's sand and water, but um, so we usually try to have a try to have a sculpt, uh, some sort of structure that incorporates lots of things, maybe a few individual elements, and ideally a sand play area. So that's the difference between um, big and large, big and small playgrounds, and where we put them. So, uh, you know, basically, I've been designing playgrounds for twenty years, and around 1998, 1999, when I came on board. Um, both the Consumer uh, Product Safety Commission, I believe that's it, the CPSC and the ASTM, the American Society for Testing and Materials, uh, came up with a set of safety rules by which play structures would be designed, playgrounds would be designed. Um, and really this was intended to um, start to address a series of you know sort of consistent playground injuries that children were experiencing within parks um, and so they're very thorough and what it resulted in was um kind of a lot of very boring playground structures <laughs> so you would see a lot of plat like a lot of platforms which you would climb up you would slide down and maybe there maybe there's a tube to crawl through but in general there wasn't a lot of sort of dynamic um, things going on with, with playgrounds. And so um, within that realm, you know, as landscape architects and parks planners, we did a lot of work at the city of Eugene to innovate to the degree that we could possible, you know, that we could um, within this set of uh, safety um, regulations. So, you know, playground, and play structure design is largely driven by play equipment manufacturers. Um, and so the onus of meeting those safety regulations largely falls on them. So it was really, you know, I felt like incumbent on us to integrate more fun and more artistry into our public playgrounds. Um, and so art has been, been kind of a big piece of um, this effort. And, uh, you know, a few places where we've, you know, incorporated artwork like the, um, 
there's a climbing, there's some climbing columns at the uh, Skinner Butte River Play project that is, those are made out of concrete and made to look like, uh, like basalt rock on a sort of a smaller scale. Those were done by an artist. Um, there's inlaid artwork in many of our playgrounds um, at Oakmont Park. There's a wonderful set of little uh, animals set into our splayper area. And then back again at the, um, at the River Play playground, we have bronze art underneath um, underneath the sand play area there is sort of a um, archaeological excavation area and then we've done a lot of tile work also um, as sort of sponsorship items so it's brought a lot of creativity and color into um, some of these playground areas and then uh, you know we've learned a ton so we've had a lot of successes in some of our creative designs and then definitely some lessons learned um, which typically means we've discovered design flaws that come up within long-term maintenance discussions. So we've chronically been challenged, of course, with our operational funding for parks. And so um, that, you know, really it, it's become ever more apparent and incumbent that we design for ease of maintenance over the long run while providing a high level of fun in our parks. So, you know, water and sand are, things that kids want to put together almost like it's almost biological they must go together so a lot of times if there is a drinking fountain too close to a sand area the drinking fountain is usually clogged because they've been mixing sand and water in the drunken fountain um, how do we keep sand and plate chips separate from each other um, and then how do we keep sand from poured in place surfacing because it sort of reduces its springiness and you know so lots of lots of design questions like that where we're you know learning to create separated areas where we're um, you know learning to figure out how to minimize these maintenance challenges while still having it be really fun for children. So uh, with the 2018 bond measure, you know, we're, we're 20 years later now, and there are, there's been tons of innovation um, in the industry. So we have a lot less post and platforms. Um, there are a lot more climbing uh, nets and twisty climbers and uh, weird things that are sort of unfamiliar uh, to children, which is great because they can go in and sort of figure out how to climb around and um, and it's it's really refreshing and um, and so with the 2018 bond measure we'll be renovating and constructing new playgrounds across the city and we're looking forward to just building in a lot more fun for everyone um, with some of this new and creative equipment so um, and again still keeping some of the classics so making sure there's swings and slides and and some of those uh, items that we all had fun with as children so uh, now to the question of the session, which is why are playgrounds so costly? And I actually prefer to think again of, um, you know, uh, construction expenses as investments uh, in our community, investments in the development of our children, um, and then investment, you know, just on the ground um, in assuring long-term safety for users of our play, uh, play equipment. So, um, you know, we invest in very durable materials and equipment so that we have them for a long time and that they are easily maintainable for the long term. Um, so we're not coming back, you know, we really look at a 20 to 25 year lifespan for a playground, if at all possible. Um, and from a long term maintenance perspective, we really uh, take the tack that investing more now means we can, you know, operate it um, with less expenses down the road. Um, so there's a lot of design time that goes in to these playgrounds. Um, there's a lot of investment in the subgrades. So underneath the ground, how are the playgrounds drained? And it's everything. Um, so I'm sure many of you have experienced the, you know, overly large puddles around merry-go-rounds and places like that, or at the end of slides or under swings. And um, providing appropriate subgrade drainage is critical to maintaining a functional playground. And then the safety surfacing is also very important. So we have to have surfacing that, you know, allows for impact attenuation so that children are safe, not if they fall, but when they fall off equipment. 
um, you know, there's plenty of guardrails and all kinds of other things, but, um, you know, children are really exploring um, their abilities and sometimes that leads to a fall and they need to be able to fall safely. And then throughout um, both installation and then into long term maintenance, we have inspections and audits. Um, and what we're really looking for is, you know, uh, a set of we look to pass a set of tests um, that's prescribed by both the CPSC and the ASTM guidelines. And so that we don't have tiny places for kids to pinch their fingers or uh, and that the connections are tight or that you can't get caught on a piece of clothing and and you know many and then that we're appropriately spaced apart and all kinds of details so that's a big piece of our, of installing playground equipment and um again it's an investment in safety of children and then an investment in uh kids really developing uh within our community in a way that's really fun and positive so what does playground design look like um maybe for the next 20 years. So um, there's definitely playground trends um, and we'll look to embrace them as best we can system wide. Um, but we'll, you know, first and foremost, we'll continue to assure that we're meeting ADA in our playground designs. Um, and so providing equal opportunities for play for all children, regardless of abilities. Um, we'll do that better for walker, children who use walkers and wheelchairs at playgrounds where we can have um, you know, more firm surfacing that doesn't displace as easily, but many of the chips, the specialty chips that we use are, do technically meet the, um, the letter of the ADA. But it also is about providing equal opportunities for ground level experiences as well as elevated. Um, so, and then um, there's lots of talk about nature play. What about nature play? Um, and nature play is really popular and i think um in portland we've seen some remarkable nature playgrounds that are um just so much fun uh and you know they're harder to maintain over time because a lot there's a lot of natural materials and so they need replacement or you know replenishment on a daily basis or you know depending upon what the activity is for the playground um so uh we you know, they, we know that they have a lot of play value. And there's also some pretty good anecdotal data that uh, parents are more likely to jump in and play with their kids in natural area playgrounds. So I think that's pretty awesome. And we'll definitely be looking to implement more of these types across our system over time. And then uh, what about inclusive play? So well, um, inclusive play is, again, it goes beyond the ADA. So it really talks more about uh, providing the ability for all children of all abilities and all people to be able to access play components or access structures and have the social interaction that, um, that is so important to all kids, you know, between each other. So, um, you know, at every community park, again, we'll, you know, invest in that surfacing, but, um, I think there's also some really great creative design opportunities with materials and products that we'll be seeing as uh, time goes on. We've certainly seen the industry um, really promote inclusive playgrounds and and come up with wonderful designs for that. And it's it's meeting a, a, a wonderful need. I think the renovation of Amazon Park was really focused on inclusivity um, as Amazon had a history of having the first ADA accessible play structure. And so we replaced that play structure with a new one and then provided much more um, accessibility around the playground as a whole. And then um, just now over the last year with what we've learned, um, you know, from social justice issues and, um, you know, all kinds of equity issues. We're starting to look beyond geography um, around playground equity. So ge the geographic perspective is we have a playground within a service area for everyone within a half mile safe walking distance of their house. But then I think the next questions that we're looking to answer are we appropriately serving surrounding neighborhoods. So you know, instead of just looking at location and, you know, sort of general state of the equipment, how old it is, when it was built, is it fun? I think we're starting to look at, oh, what is the level of density of housing around this park playground? And what does that mean for what we should be putting in for play equipment? Um, is there a strong culture within the neighborhood that we should be thinking about? What about history? What about safety? And, you know, much more. So we're developing those additional criteria, I think, to attempt to be responsive to um, this sort of, 
I, you know, almost, I guess, fourth dimension of considerations around how we evaluate playgrounds and um, how we would renovate them or improve them to be responsive to adjacent neighborhood needs. Um, and so uh, that is the end of my presentation, um, which is admittedly very short and high level. Um, but I know there will be questions, and so I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Hi, this is Mary Layton. We have listened just for a few minutes to Emily Proudfoot talk about designing playgrounds in the city of Eugene. We've asked in, uh, President elect, City Club President elect Karen Knudsen, who is an architect and the founding director of Better Homes Together, to ask the first question. Karen? Hi, thank you, Mary, and thank you, Emily, for that great presentation. I loved the focus that you had on sharing your vision of fun in our community and the importance of these investments in our kiddos and families and neighborhoods. Uh, that made me think about investments that we make as a city in our public open space and that both parks and also street bonds are two areas of investment that our um, community has stepped up for multiple times. And then in thinking about public space in cities, usually streets um, make up about 80% of that public space. So could you share a little bit about how in the vision of accessible um, and equitably accessed parks, you work with our uh, city transportation uh, officials and staff to make sure that parks are both safe and delightful when children and families reach them, and also that people have safe uh, and active uh, mode transportation access to reach them with. Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, so, of course, um, you know, a big piece of getting to and from parks, especially neighborhood parks, are walking and biking. And I think, like, uh, countless thousands of Eugene's children have learned to ride a bike in Eugene's parks. So, <laughs> um, so of course, you know, making it safe for people to get to parks. Um, uh, on sidewalks and the continuity of bike paths and within our, you know, sort of uh, alternate modes of transportation are all have been very carefully considered, I would say, in our park and recreation system plan. Um, and we do consistently consult with our uh, pedestrian and biking planning staff to incorporate, you know, their bigger picture plans into our, our park system. Um, I would also say that um, within the system plan, we talk about green connections and how are we making, you know, um, how can we create streets as park like places? Um, and, and so thinking about green streets and, um, you know, really sort of taking the environment into consideration within our streetscape, I think has also been really important along with the connections that we're looking to make to and from and between people's homes and between parks. Thank you. Kitty, uh, I have a question. Yeah, so uh, you touched on a lot of the physical safety issues, equipment, all of that kind of stuff. But we have another big issue, and that is how do you keep playgrounds and parks safe for people? Uh, as you well know, some places, some neighborhoods seem that seem to work better than other neighborhoods, and it's got and it's a constant challenge for the people who operate playgrounds and parks. So I'm interested in mm -hmm. your thinking on that. Yeah, so I'm I'm, I'm saving your uh, considering sort of behavioral safety and um, considering you know everyone who enjoys parks in our community and so part of our um, you know part of the parks and bond parks and uh, recreation bond and levy um, was to uh, really up our ability to um, provide enforcement and so we have we now have two dedicated police officers who are funded by parks levy money um, to help us with you know park security and safety uh, when it's needed we also were able to uh, you know make our park ambassador program a permanent program that's continually funded through the park levy and and our park ambassadors are fundamental to assuring that um, you know 
that parks feel safe and are safe on a continual basis. And they're very responsive to call outs from the community. In addition to that, we, you know, we're also investing in safety from a bond measure perspective with, um, we're renovating and installing a lot of new lighting systems. Um, and, you know, to the extent that those are near natural areas, being really sensitive about balancing that safety between habitat and human uh, needs in an urban context. Um, and then also just thinking about park design in general and how do you keep, you know, wide, safe, open, visible, um, you know, areas where there's not a lot of hiding places and things like that. So we think a ton about safety and design, but then also, you know, um, enforcement is a piece of that puzzle. And then I think really the third piece of a puzzle of that puzzle is programming. And so is recreation coming in and doing fun for all in parks? And are, is, are there presence of people on a regular basis to really, you know, consistently enhance that experience and keep it safe for everybody because there is more safety in numbers. And so those are kind of the, the that's sort of the three legged stool of park safety, um, but it's something we're working on uh, on a very regular basis and even more through COVID. So um, it's something we're very attuned to um, and we don't do it perfectly, but it's very challenging. So we're doing our best. Mary, can I add one follow-up? So uh, the other thing for me is uh, when you think about how you engage community to make it safer, as opposed to only thinking sort of through the lens of um, public safety profession. Mm -hmm. so for me, and I'd like to hear your, what you all are thinking about that, the more you engage the families and adults in our community in being with their children in the in the parks, that seems to elevate the safety level considerably. So I'd like to hear a little bit about thinking about that. Absolutely. Um, so I think, you know, when we program things for families, that works really well. Um, we have a lot of volunteer opportunities in parks. So opportunities for people to bring their kids and plant trees or, you know, clean up an area or things like that. So we, you know, the volunteer program had to kind of shrink or get a little bit more focused through COVID just because of numbers of people and proximities and things like that. But I think there's a lot of opportunities. And then we also have, you know, there's a lot of neighbors who are really interested in adopting their neighborhood park. And so we've seen some wonderful successes with that, with a lot of, um, you know, children and families and parents coming and doing work parties at Sodden Park or at, you know, their local neighborhood park and that they've, um, they sort of adopted that park and committed to some, you know, four work parties a year, just in investing and in, in taking better care of it. And it's wonderful, like sort of role modeling for kids and really great family activities outdoors in a place that they all care about. Thank you. Yeah. So that brings me to the very first question that the park users get offered to me. So I, I went to, into Amazon Park and I asked all the grownups there what questions they had. And the very first question, um, it came from uh, a couple of women my age who said, how do you decide when you have enough bathrooms? Our ability to stay for any length of time at a park depends on how many, if a bathroom is, a safe, clean bathroom is available. Right. Uh, so um, the presence of a restroom is sort of question A, and then keeping them safe and clean, I think, was your second part of that question. So. Um, as far as restroom locations are concerned, for the most part, you're going to see them in community parks. Um, there's a few in some neighborhood parks, um, and but from a code perspective, actually, um, generally neighborhood parks are not provided with a restroom. We have we sometimes provide um, sort of summer restrooms in some locations, especially like um, if there's a lot of water and sand or something like that. But Mostly you'll see these stick built restrooms in community parks um, because from a code perspective, uh, they, you have to get a special permit to put them in a neighborhood park. A lot of times we don't have room for a big stick built one in a neighborhood park as well. Um, and so restrooms are, uh, you know, sort of the rel their relative cleanliness and safety. Um, we were able to bring a lot more restrooms back online um, as we had closed a lot of them uh, due to budget cuts. So with the levy, we were able to bring in, um, bring many of them back online and they get serviced at least once a day. Some of them get serviced twice. Um, and so of course, restroom safety is pretty paramount for our community um, and, and we take it seriously. Um, if there's a restroom that's really been, you know, kind of torn apart or, you know, 
is really kind of unsafe for everybody, that restroom will be closed until we have the time to come and clean it back up. So that's sort of the, we take the cleanliness and safety of restrooms really seriously. Um, and then as far as location, uh, you know, we have, they're mostly located in community parks, some in neighborhood parks. And then if we need additional service in the summer um, where we have maybe additional activities like a spray play park or sand and water or something like that, we've been providing a temporary restroom uh, for those locations. Karen? This is well, maybe a bit of a follow-up question, but I think it's important to think about relative to our parks as active spaces in the community. Um, there's such an important role that they can have in supporting the health and actually like long-term healthy outcomes for adults as well as children. Um, and it's interesting when you visit sometimes other places, you'll notice now, I think seeing, and maybe you mentioned this sort of park trends, more and more parks that are being very explicit about trying to integrate um, active adult like engagement and play spaces in the park's design. Can you talk a little bit about whether or not the city of Eugene is considering and you know, um, components like this? And it could be everything from a walking path so that you know, parents or guardians are not just standing and watching their kids play um, to actual like exercise equipment or um, you know, intergenerational uh, play structures. That's a great question. It's one I didn't really address in the trends, so I'm glad you asked it, Karen. Um, yes, adult play or adult exercise is definitely a trend. Um, and I've experienced some of them when I've gone to other big cities and they've been really fun. Um, and then we're starting to do, um, you know, a, we're seeing, we're doing a little bit of it. So in parks where we can have a big circular walking path, um, typically we're, we're building those. Um, you know, we really, we see the benefit of those um, in neighborhoods in general. People love walking them. If we're able to post how many miles they are, all the better, really great. Um, and then we do have some, you know, stretching stations and sort of little workout areas um, that exist in some parks, but we're looking to renovate those or replace them. Um, and then as we move into, you know, uh, developing new community parks or um, renovating community parks, I think we'll definitely start um, to work on some of these, uh, you know, adult exercise areas or being sure just to include, there's also senior play, I think, and we're looking to uh, potentially, um, you know, add uh, at least one of those types of areas, maybe by the Campbell Senior Center, so we can kind of co-locate these things and that they provide an opportunity for um, expansion of programmed services within a community center setting. So you might see that at Peterson Barn as well, or these places where we have sort of targeted groups for um, that kind of recreation. Can I add one, ask one question about that, uh, Karen? Is that okay? Oh, absolutely. I just wanted to say you've got the new, all the new improvements that's the Les Senior Center, which you brought up. Are, have they taken into consideration in that development some uh, think some senior exercise places? Yes, yes. I think they, I'm not sure if they have internal, I mean, I think they have space for I mean, internal outside, exercise, but outside. Yeah. Yes. So we've been working, you know, with recreation and you know, funding has kind of gone up and down like this and within the project now, yeah, anyway. So we've, but it's definitely uh, something that they're very interested in pursuing and that we've been uh, working closely with recreation um, to provide. So I think, you know, sometime in the next year or two, hopefully we'll be able to um, add that into the outdoor uh, component of the new Camel Center. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. At Amazon, one of the kids asked, uh, they commented that back east, like Brooklyn someplace, uh -huh. they, they found a ninja playground. And I looked it up online to make sure it really was a thing. And it is a thing. And so yes. the kids said, are we ever going to have a ninja playground? That's so interesting. And I was like, I was like, does that include the turtles or is this just like a branded thing? I couldn't really, so I had to look it up as well, to be honest. And, um, and so just for our listening audience, um, you know, basically it's a, um, it's a playground that's really focused on kind of really fun, like sort of athletic activities. So they seem to have these gymnastics rings and crazy big ladders and lots of climbing poles and things that look like, um, 
maybe you would be training to be a firefighter or something, you know, like that, or, um, or a gymnast or, you know, so it's really pretty focused on, um, on these sort of, on your sort of strength and agility, I feel like. Um, and I haven't seen them before. So, um, you know, I can't really comment on that, but I, you know, we're open. We, you know, we're, we're super open to, um, and new and engaging ways for kids to play. And I could certainly see that as a, um, you know, we don't have a ton of sort of teen um, playgrounds or sort of teen hangout spaces. And so to me, this could sort of address like the tween yep. or, or teen um, sort of age group in a way that would be really fun and creative. So certainly open to that. Cool. Karen, I think has another question. I do. And this is, is crowdsourced uh, and related to a lot of um, enthusiasm around the development of the downtown riverfront park space, mm -hmm. uh, but also thinking about our river engagement in general and park space along the river. And the question is whether or not Eugene or Eugene Springfield are considering any um, installations of river-based play, like mm. kayak play area or standing wave that would allow people to um, be in the river and playing actively uh, in that waterscape. So I know that we think, you know, there's a, um, there's a private group of uh, water sport enthusiasts who's been working um, hard within the community to bring that uh, forward as a, as a potential project um, for actually both cities. I would say Willamalane, uh, Park and Rec and city of Eugene. Um, we don't have it in any of our immediate long-term plans, I think. Um, and so, uh, and I'm not, I'll be honest, I'm not completely sure of the status of the project, but it is something we kind of keep our ears tuned to. And um, I think, you know, might look to assisting with in the future if, you know, um, you know, if it came forth as a, a really big priority for the, for the city. So I could see that in the very long run. I don't see it in the short run, but it's certainly something that we're hearing about. You know, clearly Bend has one that's um, very accessible, very popular. Um, and so I think, you know, we have a beautiful river. We should have one here too. And so I think um, it, those kinds of projects probably take a decade of planning and permitting to really um, sort of realize, given that it's in water work and, and sometimes it, it does involve, you know, potentially changing flows of rivers and things like that. So there's a lot of environmental checks that you have to, you know, boxes you have to check. But um, having said that, it would be amazing. I know a lot, we, you know, to the degree that we can get people enjoying the river for its beauty and its environmental quality, you know, the more the better, so. I have a, a question of my own. Um, when I drive down Amazon Parkway, mm -hmm. uh, I, it finally occurred to me to notice that there are a string of developments, South Eugene High School, uh, Roosevelt to Amazon Park, and then connected like a long, long line of green space that I, I often drive on purpose just to enjoy it. Um, and I wondered, who did that? Who, who makes a decision that uses places that have different purposes that creates a third, you know, a, another dimension to their presence in town? You know, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I think, um, you know, if, uh, if we sort of think about where our city started and where some of our oldest parks are, it is in Southeast Eugene. Um, and so, you know, that's where South Eugene High School has been there forever. Um, you know, after that, Roosevelt, I mean, those schools and their accompanying fields, you know, definitely provided green space. And then over time, um, you know, Amazon Park was acquired over um, a series, uh, you know, a series of acquisitions of smaller properties over time. And then protection of the Amazon corridor, you know, so basically we have the Amazon Creek and the headwaters of the Amazon Creek that flow through South Eugene and then turn north and west. Um, and I think that's provided, you know, not only an opportunity for sort of green conservation within the Amazon park setting, but then also along the parkway and down to the headwaters. And so there's a lot of green there because we are actually protecting, a, you know, a water resource that, you know, eventually flows to the Willamette and, um, 
And so improving water quality and maintaining water quality while uh, maintaining conveyance is uh, continues to be a priority for our parks and open space. And that's, you know, those are the services we're providing more in the natural areas as opposed to developed park areas, but they, they intermix all the time. And um, yeah, I think, you know, the preservation of the green space around both the Willamette River and the Amazon corridor create these beautiful links across neighborhoods and through the city. One of the questions um, uh, one of the parents asked was, how do you, or how will you accommodate when uh, neighborhoods uh, finally allow the missing middle housing to be built? Mm. Or when mm -hmm. each ward accepts a share of people who need supported housing, and so density increases. So you right. can see that a park has got a size associated with the likely density of the neighborhood. But if we up the density, how mm -hmm. would you deal with the park? You know, again, we're looking at like a service area, you know, as a half, a half mile walking distance. But I think, you know, as we look forward to some of these new criteria that we're looking at, I think we'll also be looking to how do we respond to those. So I think like, okay, if we know an area is really gonna densify, can we make the playground a little bigger? Um, and then how many kids will be playing on it? We might up the quality so it can really handle like tons of kids every day. And then, you know, oh, well maybe we put in an extra set of swings or we, you know, so really thinking about, okay, who are we serving within this dense neighborhood? I think that's gonna be a new challenge for us. And I, um, I kind of look forward to talking with my colleagues about and, and talking to other, you know, municipalities or groups about, you know, how do we best serve very dense communities and, you know, are there sometimes within those dense communities, you know, there is uh, a playground on their own site or something like that, but then how do we really augment and best serve them? And I think that's a question that's still kind of open-ended for us, but I look forward to solving it. Yep. Uh, Kitty? I, I, so you made me really think about something new, but, uh, Mary and Emily, and th that to me is as we, as you recall the vigorous discussion we had about the Willamette area, um, I, when I think about people's concern about uh, infill and those kinds of things, I think part of it can allay some of that concern is that you carve out coordinated space through there for um, parks and recreation areas so that even as mm -hmm. you're densifying you're not forgetting that people want to live in a place where they can see green space and you're not forgetting yes. that you could connect green spaces in a way that could create a lot of different kinds of opportunities that we don't have but it's sort of like the amazon corridor kind of thing so uh, it seems to me that that should be an uh, not something you have to put back after you've taken it away it should be something that we we think about as we try to figure out how we're going to do the kind of housing opportunities for people that we want and it should be uh, built into that and that's not only in my view not only a city responsibility but it's kind of a developer responsibility at the same time it's a, it's a partnership that might give us something that we don't currently have in a in a different way and i just wanted to toss that into the mix for people to to think about as i look at karen's face and i know how engaged she is in this and i'm and mary comments i i think there's a way to make lemonade and <laughs> and i think we ought to be smart enough to get ahead of the curve as opposed to always having to try to fix something that's gone awry so that's just my uh my, you made me think about that and I wanted to bring it up for people who are listening and for you to comment on Emily. Yeah, it's, it's a really good point. And I think, um, you know, our land use code currently requires that, you know, if a new neighborhood is close to a park, you have to provide very easy access to that park. Like you can't go around the block and over there and over here, like, you know, you need to make a direct connection off the back, even if it's inconvenient. So there's definitely some land use code pieces that already sort of incentivize um, sort of activation of green space or um, access to green space within new development. I think it's super important. And then if we're gonna then continue, you know, with this idea that we have in our system plan about green streets and creating green spaces, um, you know, within our right of ways, then I think we begin to further expand that. But I, you know, 
um, planting trees and creating green spaces or open spaces anywhere within existing new development is really important. Um, and, and integrating I, play opportunities with. Absolutely. With, absolutely. And they can be very simple, but it, but those play opportunities are key. So this is probably a great follow up to then. And it's another question that, you know, would really push on sort of interjurisdictional partnership. Uh, but in thinking about that long range plan and vision of our system and access to parks and open space and trail systems that allow for kids and families and adults to um, live out their best version of life in our valley home. Could you talk a little bit about um, your vision, your imagining of the Rivers to Ridges plan? And oh. if there is a idea about how looking into the future we could see a really remarkable generational contribution to our open space network across the entirety of the community. Um, well, I'm, you know, I'm not the residential park expert on this, but it is, you know, we, our trails plan does uh, integrate very well with rivers to ridges. And so our trails plan really envisions a loop of trail systems all the way around our community that you would be able to, you know, hike or bike or walk. And so as we go forward, we're looking for land acquisitions all around those areas and so that, you know, that are adjacent to neighborhoods or places where people live or will live. And so that they do have that ease of access um, to all these wonderful places, even if it's not by a car, they could just keep walking. So um, the River to Ridges plan is phenomenal. It's a partnership that goes across jurisdictions, across municipalities, um, and it's an amazing intergovernmental set of agreements and partnerships that have come a very long way since its inception to creating a, um, a holistic trail network. And I just, I can't see it, uh, help but see it to continue to be successful across our community. Thank you so much, Emily Proudfoot. We are uh, now, greatly better informed on how playgrounds are made and we look forward to seeing the work you do in the future. Thanks Karen for, and, and Kitty for helping us elaborate on the whole concept of playgrounds in cities. This has been our June 11th, 2021 program, Why Playgrounds Are Worth the Price. Before we proceed, I'd like to recognize our diamond sponsors. Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente exists to provide high quality, affordable health care services and to improve the health of our members and community we serve. More information can be found at www.kp.org. Support also comes from the University of Oregon. Since 1876, U of O has helped Oregonians question critically, think logically, reason effectively, communicate clearly, act creatively and live ethically. More information at uoregon.edu. Peace Health. Peace Health is proud to serve Eugene, Lane County and beyond. As your hometown healthcare partner for more than 80 years, our mission is to keep you and your family healthy. Learn more at peacehealth.org. Lane Community College. Lane Community College transforms lives through learning, LCC provides comprehensive, accessible, high quality education opportunities that promote student success. For more information, visit lanecc.edu. I would also like to acknowledge our gold sponsors, Pacific Cascade Federal Credit Union and Jerry Dietthelm Architect Landscape Architect. Our Ruby sponsor, Johnson Johnson Lucas and Middleton. Support for the City Club comes from Johnson, Johnson, Lucas, and Middleton, a team of experienced, compassionate attorneys fighting for justice. If you have been seriously harmed by wrongdoing and need help, contact us at justicelawyers.com. And our Sapphire sponsor, Summit Bank. Support for the City Club comes from Summit Bank, your local community bank, an independent community bank headquartered in Eugene. Summit Bank serves businesses and professionals in Eugene, Springfield, and Central Oregon communities. For more information, visit sbko.bank. Before we thank our speakers today, 
I have a few quick announcements. Thank you to our in-kind sponsors, KRVM 91.9 Radio, Pack Info and Simplified Computing, LLC, Dot Dotson's Photography, and a special thank you to public radio station KLCC FM 89.7 for airing City Club programs on Mondays at 7. Our programs are always available to you on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. If you are a City Club of Eugene member, and we want you to be one, you can ask a question at a future taping of our program. If you're not yet a member, you can join and then participate. More information is on our website, cityclubofeugene.org. Our next program, we will talk about the new jet age, the future of Southwest Oregon airports. Are we at the beginning of a new age in aviation? How should we think about airports and air travel in the context of economic competitiveness and environmental sustainability? We ask these questions and more at our June 18th program. More details and information about future programs can be found online at the City Club's website, cityclubofeugene.org. Now, I really want to thank today's speaker for a great program. Good to have you here, Emily Proudfoot. This concludes today's program. Be well and stay safe.